and Samson and Muscatese. And uh, we're, we're having Sean preach in our church this morning, Sean, Sean Folker. So it's good to, good to do that. Um, I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning to uh, Psalm 103. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was, on, I was out in the Churchill River in northern Saskatchewan. Um, I, I cleared it first. It was legal with the government of Saskatchewan to go up there with a few guys and go fishing and canoeing. And uh, I've been doing that for about 20 years now, maybe 25. And uh, the river's the same. I, I like going up there because it seems always the same. You know, it's not like life here that changes when you get a virus and things like that. It's always the same up there. And I usually celebrate my birthday up there. And when I was up uh, there, my birthday came, and I got up early in the morning, made a fire, put on some coffee, got up the Word of God, and I read Psalm 103 and 104. And uh, I, I, I love, those are probably my two favorite scriptures because uh, one of them um, tells me how, who God is and how good He is, and the other one tells me how beautiful He's made His world and the things He does. So this morning, I just want to take a few minutes to go through Psalm 103. My style has always been going through Scripture and uh, just seeing what the Lord has for us this morning. Before I do, I just want to pray. Lord, I pray that you'll open up your Word to our hearts this morning by the power of your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. The psalmist starts out this way. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. The psalmist starts out uh, this psalm uh, the way he starts out many psalms that he wrote. This is a psalm of David. And he says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, praise the Lord sometimes is uh, so, sort of a, getting to be a trite phrase for a lot of believers. But uh, we have to understand what those words mean. And they really mean this. They mean giving honor, value, and worth to the object of praise. And, uh, you know, we do this to people all the time. Um, sometimes genuinely, sometimes not so genuinely. Sometimes it's just out of formality. Sometimes it's out of pretense. Uh, politicians are good at praising people in, out of pretense, you know, just to make people feel good, you know. But, but what David is talking about here is a whole other thing. He's talking about praising the Lord from his inner being, from his soul. That's the part of us that uh, no one can see, but it's in there. In fact, uh, when we die, you know, it's with the Lord, we're just a shell. You take the soul out of a person, then that's their, their lifeless. But the life that we have in us is in our soul, and uh, we need to praise the Lord from our hearts, from the soul. Now, for me, uh, beauty gets me to do that. When I go out to someplace beautiful like the mountains or the northern wilderness in Saskatchewan, places like that, you know, where I can see the works of God right in front of my face, I, I'm filled with an awe, and it drives me to praise. I want to praise the Lord when I'm there. And, uh, and we want to praise the Lord when we sense the closeness of Him. Um, praise coming from our soul directed to our Creator and Savior is, is true praise. And we need to do it a lot. David finds a word as he outpours his soul. And the first word, you know, and a word which describes the character of God is, is really who God is in essence. God is a holy God. God is a holy God. David praises the holy name of God. The holy name. The Jews knew about this holy name. In fact, they knew that God's name was so holy they wouldn't even print it out. They wouldn't even write it out. They took out the vowels, they just left as consonants, and they basically could not even pronounce the name of God because it was so holy. They couldn't write it out. 
But, the, but, but what holy really means is this. It means unique, one of a kind, and separate. And that's the way God is. He's unique. There's no one like Him. He's one of a kind. There's no one else like Him in all the world, and He's separate. You know, He's the only one. Jesus said this, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It means that God stands apart from anything else that people will worship. There's no one else worthy of our worship. There's no one like God. Nothing can compare to Him. In fact, His name is so holy that in the Ten Commandments we're commanded to never misuse the name of the Lord. God wants us to be careful with our words. So, so the best we can do with our words is simply to praise Him. You know, to look to God and say, God, you are awesome. God, I want to praise you with my soul. And you can't praise God or even think about God without thinking about His goodness. And I know that that has been what we've been thinking about lately through this whole thing. You know, you can think about all the stuff that we're having to do without or, you know, things like that. But we've been spending a lot of time in our home just thanking the Lord for who He is and for what He's done and how He's, you know, giving us so much in spite of the things that we're living through right now. David calls, uh, David says, uh, the goodness of God are his benefits. You know, he calls this his benefits. He, we get that word benefactor from that. He says, he says uh, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, we should never forget the benefits of God. And it's good to repeat the benefits of God. It's good to sit around and talk about the benefits of God with our family. The the, the Old Testament Jews, they would talk about the goodness of God with their families, and we need to do that too. I grew up in a Christian Reformed church. We'd spend every meal having devotions after our meal, talking about God, and that's a good thing to do. The benefits of God are awesome. He lists them here. You know, he's, he, he says that they're, they're, they're he, it's forgiveness and healing and redemption and salvation and love and satisfied desires and renewed life. You know, these all flow directly from the, 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 the character of God. You know, when, uh, when we moved to Musquachis years ago, we found out about the benefits of living in oil country and that the people at one time had lots of oil money that came their way. But one thing we know about government benefits and even the things like uh, the government bailouts that, he's, that they're going on right now is that they're temporary. You know, there's a limit to how much money the government can give, believe it or not. But there's no limit to the benefits of God. And these are not cash benefits. They're better than cash because they satisfy our soul, and that's what we really need. He talks about the eagles who demonstrate the kind of joy that Jesus describes in John, John uh, uh, 10, verse 10. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. When we were on the Churchill, we saw probably a hundred or more eagles, and every time I see an eagle, I'm reminded about those verses of eagles in the Bible that talks about, and most of the time they talk about a renewal of life, a renewal of joy. And, uh, you know, when we came together the first time in our church in Muscogee, there was a, a feeling of joy that was so great, you know, it's like we had our joy renewed again, you know. And that's what happens when we serve a God that's living and working in spite of the crises that we face in life. There's a fullness of joy. It's a picture of glory. You know, St. Arrhenius once penned, he said this, he said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And man can only be fully alive when he is alive in Christ. And God gives us joy. The picture that David paints here of God in this psalm is a God who is for us and a God who loves us deeply. It goes on in verse 6 through 10. It says this. It says, He will not... Oh, sorry, my eyes are kind of... <laughs> the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known His ways to Moses, His deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. These days we see a lot of protests going on out there. 
You know, you watch TV and it seems like wherever you are, wherever you are in the world nowadays, there's something going on. You know, people mean well and they want change. And there's always that hunger for change because people aren't satisfied. And we live in a world that will never satisfy them and so they seek change in ways that probably will never satisfy and that's political change. We need something more than politics, you know. People forget that we as a human race are inherently evil, you know. We believe that, you know. Reformed faith teaches that, that, that we're totally depraved, you know. We need something more than ourselves to dig us out of the hole that we've created for ourselves. So David reminds us here of the righteousness of God, you know. God is righteous, and therefore in him and through him we will find true justice. That's the only place that we're going to find true justice. Nothing else will ever be found apart from God. We're, not, we're going to have temporary maybe little fixes that politicians can give us, but you know what? True justice will only come from God. And we see that in our native people that we work with too. There's always some plans that come their way to help them, but the only thing, you know, and I guess over 30 years of experience up in the mission field that I've seen really help people is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When the heart changes, other things change. No, money doesn't start dropping out of the sky. But when your heart changes, that's the beginning of true change. And you know what? Marches and protests and everything like that, even if there are a million of them, they can't accomplish what God could do if they would turn to them. We need a revival. That's what we need in our country, in our world. We need people to turn to the Lord. We need the kingdom of heaven to come down to provide healing and restoration and justice for the races. I'm all for justice, but I know, but I know where true justice comes. It comes from the Lord. And the Bible even describes that. In heaven, there's a tree whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. If we don't get true justice here, which we probably won't, we will receive it in heaven once and for all. Until then, it's the task of the church to bring the justice of the kingdom of heaven to earth. So there's no room for racism. There's no room for any kind of bigotry or hatred of other people. There's no room for oppression of any kind. The church's job and role in this world is to live out the righteousness of God, to bring God's kingdom to earth. In verse 7, David talks about relationship, and he uses the example of Moses and his relationship with God. It says here that God made known his ways to Moses, his ways to Moses. I have a young Cree friend named Alex Smith who was on our camp a few weeks ago, and uh, I've spent a lot of time with him. I've known him since he was a little kid, about 11 years old, used to bring him on camps with us. And, uh, and uh, during those years, he learned my ways. <laughs> And so when he came on the camp, he knew what was expected of him, you know, and uh, he, he, he could make fire and he could, uh, you know, do things around camp. And, and he told me, I know exactly what you want, Tom, you don't even have to tell me, you know. And so, he, and, and you know what, knowing, knowing, and I'll tell you another one that knows my ways is my wife, and she knows the good stuff and the bad stuff. I'll tell you that for sure. But Moses was taught God's ways. In other words, Moses knew how God did things. And that's because he spent a lot of time with God, not just around God, but with God. And I hope that this time off, if we've had any time off, probably dairy farmers haven't, but uh, maybe some of the other people have had a little bit more time to think about God and think about his ways and build your relationship with God. I know that happened with Donna and I. We've taken more time to get into the Word to get into prayer for people and things like that. And I hope that continues. Moses became God's friend, just like the psalmist David who's writing this. He became a friend of God, and God is willing to show us his ways, but it takes time to nurture a friendship. God wants us to do that with him. Think of God as someone who wants to be a friend of yours. It's good friendship. Now, now, we've all seen, you know, kids who pick up their traits. And since it's Father's Day, think of kids who pick up their father's traits. And that's what God wants us to do. When we spend time with him, he wants us to pick up what he's doing and start to live like him. 
This is what Jesus says. This is what John, I mean, uh, John wrote in 1 John 2, verse 6. He, he wrote this. He said, whoever claims to live in him, and that's in Jesus, must walk as Jesus walked. Now, there's a contrast given here. It says that Moses knew the ways of God, but the people of Israel knew his deeds. Deeds and ways are different. You know, the people of Israel, they saw what God could do. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They saw the pillar of cloud that led them during the day, the pillar of fire that kept their camp lit up at night. They saw the miracles like manna come down from heaven to feed them. They saw the, the, the Jordan part when they went into the promised land. They saw all kinds of things like that. But they didn't enter into an intimate relationship with God. And I think that describes some Christians sometimes. We know all about God. We go to church. We hear about Him. We, you know, we study Him. But there's a difference about knowing about God and knowing God Himself. When I was 22 years old, I came into a crisis in my life. I went to church all my life. I went to Christian school all my life. But I didn't really know God until a friend pointed out something that was always there, that God wants to enter into a relationship with us by faith. He wants to become our personal Lord and Savior. And so I needed to confess my sin before God personally and uh, not rely on my parents or whatever things I had been in through Christian school and church, but to come into a personal relationship with God by faith, my own faith. And you know what? It changed my life. It, it, it changed my life completely. And it's still changing. You know, is life perfect? No. It's dynamic and alive. And sometimes there's messy stuff, but God's still working. And that's what he's talking about here. I love the description of God in verses 8 through 10. I wish this was a description of me myself. You know, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Now let those words sink in, folks. You know, so sometimes we, we sing that song. In fact, I see we're going to sing it after the message, Good, Good Father. And uh, this is a description of one. You know, when you read these verses, you say, this is who God is. God is this full of mercy, you know? You know, a lot of times when we talk about our Father, you know, our, our minds go to our earthly fathers. And I don't know about you, but almost all of us have earthly fathers who were flawed men, you know? And I'm a flawed man. When, I, when uh, you know, my kids would, uh, you know, they honor me today by saying Happy Father's Day, but you know what? I'm a flawed man, you know? And most fathers are. But our Heavenly Father isn't. And He loves us more than you could ever think. And He shows us a way to be as men here, as people here, forgiving. You know, it, uh, you know uh, He's not our accuser. You know, that's what the devil does. God doesn't accuse us, you know. He doesn't harbor anger toward us. He doesn't give us what our sins deserve. I like what it says there. You know, He doesn't pay us for all the wrong we've done Him. You know, he doesn't repay us. In fact, I get one word out of these words, and it glaringly stands out, and the word is grace. God is a gracious God. And I love that word, grace. I, I wish we had that word in our church's name. We call our, our, our church Muscogee's Bible Fellowship Church. And if we could add one more word, I'd like Muscogee's Grace Bible Fellowship Church, but it makes it too long, you know. But that's what God is. God is a God of grace. Grace is giving people what they don't deserve. It's, a loving, it's loving the sinner as God does. And God wants us to be that way towards people. He doesn't want us to look at people and say, you know, make prejudgments of them. He wants us to say, I love you no matter who you are or where you came from. He's a loving, he's a loving Father, and He's good, and He's all grace. It goes on in verse 11, it says this. It says... For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As, f as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those 
who fear him. You know, the psalmist can't keep from praising God for his goodness. He just resorts to kind of hyperbole here. You know, he describes God's love as being as high as the heavens above the earth. And I can imagine David standing there thinking about this as he's sit on a hill at night and he's looking up into a clear night sky that has stars going on forever and ever. And he's thinking about how God's love, how, how, how his love is high as the heavens are above the earth. That means that he's, the love is incomparable. I mean, it's, it's, it's astounding. You can't think of an adjective that describes that love. You know, back, that, that's how great God's love is for us. And he talks about forgiveness, because love and forgiveness always go together. You can't love without forgiving. You know that? It says his forgiveness is as far as the east is from the west. Two opposite directions going off into eternity. That's how far, that's how complete God's forgiveness is for us. I love that, you know. Once our sins are forgiven, they're gone for good. You know, a lot of times we, we think we, we, we you know, not the Native people struggle with this, their past. It's always their past, you know. I have to drag around my past like the ball and chain. But when we describe the forgiveness of God, that they're set free from their past, it's amazing. And it does amazing things in a person's life who understands God's forgiveness. The Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The blood of Christ, the Bible says, cleanses us from all sin. We stand righteous before God because of his forgiveness. But that's not all. God, David talks about God's compassion in verse 13. You know, God's not an impersonal God without feelings. You know, compassion is one of those feelings that people have when they have empathy. And the old King James said this as, as uh, you know, it uses that word pitieth, you know, as, uh, as uh, what does it say? As, uh, here, as a father pitieth his children. You know, and I like that word. It means that you look to someone and you just feel for them inside. And that's the way God is. But he's not just a God who just sits there on his feelings. He wants to do something about it. When God has compassion on us, he gives us a way out of the mess that we're in. And that's the thing that we like to tell, tell people out there in Moscatis. You know, there's a lot of hurt out there. A lot of hurt. In the last month since I mean, the last few months since COVID hit, we've had 32 deaths in Muscogee. 32 deaths. It's not a big community, and it's right next door. They're not COVID deaths, by the way. None of them. But they're, they may be related. There's been suicide out there. There's been, um, you know, just lots of deaths due to addictions and things like that. But you know what? God looks at that community, and he says, I have compassion for those people. They're struggling. They need help. And I, I just want to say this, please pray for the people. The chief called a, a prayer meeting the other day uh, in his council, and he got all the Christians. And I, 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 I couldn't believe how wonderful it was to go into that council chamber and to pray for the people with the chief's blessing. And it went all over on their Facebook Live and on their radio and all that kind of stuff. But that's what God does for us. He has compassion, and he wants to do something, even though we're sinners. You know, God's compassion extends to those who fear him and are part of his family. And, and you know what? His compassion drives us to obedience. Because when someone loves us that much, we want to obey him. We're so grateful for what he's done for us. We'll finish up here. It says this. It says, um, it says, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. I think these verses describe the intimate way that God knows us. You know, to him we're not just like a name or a number. You know, I, I, I know when I was a kid I struggled with my identity. You know, sometimes 
I, I felt like no one really knew me, you know. They look at me and they say, oh, you're this, you know. And a lot of people say that about anybody. They look at the outside of the person, they, they say, this is what you must be. But see, God knows who we really are. You know, when he looks inside of us, he knows exactly who we are. And another thing that I found out about the Lord is that he knew the desires of my heart and he knew what I really needed, you know. He foreknew who I would become even, you know. It's pretty cool. And, and, I, and the thing that really made me understand um, the reality of God is, re is knowing how much he loved me and knowing how much he wanted to direct my life. Because when I put my, hand, my life in God's hands, he brought me to the place of, of, of satisfaction and fulfillment. And, and that's what he's saying here. He, he gives us good things, you know. The Bible says that the enemy only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the full. And, that, and, it, and the psalmist writes in Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that means that God is concerned where our lives are going, and he wants, he wants to bless our lives. You know? That doesn't mean we're going to live trouble-free lives, for sure. But God's blessing is on our lives. And even though our lives are temporary, you know, the psalmist talks here about, you know, stuff that is very temporary, that when our, we commit our lives to the Lord, you know, God has our souls in mind, and he has our bodies in mind to resurrect someday and live with him forever. And so da, the, the, the psalmist, he ends with praise here. It says, the Lord has established his throne, in verse 19, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You know, um, it, the Lord has directed David in this psalm to end with a crescendo of praise where he began. In closing, David brings us into the throne room of, of God in heaven. And that's a glorious place to be. Uh, Isaiah was there, and when he went there, he saw the Lord lifted up and high. And from that throne, God rules the universe. One of the things that uh, we understood really quickly when COVID came, we were at a meeting in Louisville Church on the res, and there was a Blackfoot preacher up there, and he was having some revival meetings, and that's when COVID just struck. And he said, you know, the Lord was in this thing because nobody else could shut down baseball and hockey and basketball and all the worldly things that people love and with one little virus and so quickly. And so right from the start, I, I started to understand that yes, the Lord is sovereign and the Lord is in control. And the Lord allows these kind of things to happen for good. You know, all things work together for good, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28. So what is the purpose of all this? The purpose of this is for us to recognize that God, not COVID, not anything out there, is in control. And that God's purpose will be fulfilled through this. And that even, God's, and that even God, God will do good through it, you know. And the neat thing about it is that we've discovered things, and maybe your pastor has too, that, you know, even preaching online, you think, how's that going to do any good? Well, there are people being reached all over the world when you get online. There's people listening to those messages that are going out from all these preachers now. You know, it's like the salt was in the shaker in this little church, but now it's being shook on all the whole world, you know? You know, people are coming to know the Lord. People who are afraid are finding courage because God is being preached throughout the world. So we need to rejoice in that, you know? In Psalm 46, verses 6 and 7, it says, Nations are in an uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. And you know what? That's what I think of. I think of God, the hand of God. He can shake things up and he can get people's attention. And when he does, hearts are open to receive the truth. So I'm excited. God is still here, 
God is still in control. So David brings us to heaven, and he asks the angels to praise the Lord. These are God's messengers. They do his bidding. They carry out his works. They need to praise the Lord. He looks up into the sky, the countless stars, you know, the, 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 and he, the moon and the sun and everything else, God's servants, he asks them to praise the Lord. And then he looks down to creation, God's works here. And that includes us, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And he asks us to praise him, and we will, because he's a good, good father. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that uh, over the years, Lord, We've read this psalm after communion in the church, and uh, it was like dessert. It was like the sweetness of God after the holy meal. And thank you, God, that this psalm has always been an encouragement to us, Lord, when we're looking for strength, when we feel weak, when we're looking for forgiveness, when, we, when we're guilty, when we're looking for hope, when uh, the world seems hopeless. Lord, thank you that you are a good, good Father, Lord, that you created us and that you sustain us, Lord, and that you will bring us to be in your presence forever someday. And we pray that we'll spread this word of hope to people, Lord, who are dying all around us, Lord, that we won't just um, take you as our own and just say, well, that's good enough, but Lord, our lips and mouths and tongues and um, our feet will move in the direction of people that need to know about you. And Lord, that we'll be brave and that we talk about a God who loves us and a God that delivers us from everything, even the pestilence is around us. Just bless us as we go from here. Bless these people, Lord. Thank you for keeping them together in this church. Thank you for their pastor. We thank you for their elders, their leadership, Lord. We just pray for them as they face the challenges uh, of doing church in these conditions, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, that they could meet here this morning. Just bless them and bless our fellowship too, Lord, out there in Muscochise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.